Hey Curious Minds, I'm Dr Becky, welcome back to my channel and today I want to talk about another unsolved mystery in physics and this is all about the idea of direct collapse black holes, whether black holes can form by direct collapse of matter rather than through a supernova or something else like that. So at the end of 2017 astronomers discovered the furthest known supermassive black hole in the universe. So it was 800 million times the mass of the sun and it was 13 billion light years away, which is pretty cool in itself. But the problem is that something that's 13 billion light years away, the light has taken 13 billion years to reach us. So it means that the, the object that it left 13 billion years ago was in a universe that was only like 700 million years old because the universe itself is only 13.7 billion years old and this supermassive black hole had a mass of 800 times the mass of the sun like it was huge so the question is how did the black hole grow from you know nothing you know after the big bang when the first stars were being formed to 800 million times the mass of the sun in only 700 million years in fact less than that because you know by the time the big bangs happened you've not immediately got stars so say 600 million years. So this went against sort of all our theories for how black holes grow and how quickly they can grow as well. So there's three different ways that you can form a black hole, right? There's a supernova, there's a neutron star, neutron star merger, or there's this idea of direct collapse, black holes, okay? So in a supernova, that's probably what most people are familiar with, right? Like massive star, end of life, runs out of hydrogen, starts sort of runaway fusion through helium burning and lithium burning all the way up until it gets to iron, which when it can't do anything anymore and it explodes in this huge supernova and then whatever's left in the middle collapses down under its own gravity into a black hole. And those are kind of like a hundred times the mass of the sun stars that do that and they give you, you know, the like 10, 20 solar mass black holes at the end. The lesser step down from that is that a slightly lower mass star, so something say like 50, 75 times the mass of the sun, when it gets to the end of its life, instead of forming a black hole, it's not got enough mass to do that, so it ends up as a neutron star, which is like a star where all the space has been squashed out of atoms, electrons have been forced to merge with protons, and you've just got like really tightly packed neutrons in this star. If you have two of those, perhaps there was a binary star system, both of them, those stars ended their life and ended up as neutron stars, and then you could merge them together and form a black hole that way. That's option two. Option three is this idea of a direct collapse black hole. So a star perhaps can be happily burning its fuel and all of a sudden directly collapse into a black hole. So the Hubble Space Telescope has actually sort of seen this happening. Uh, there was a 25 times the mass of the sun star that just winked out of existence. And the idea was that it just went directly from being a star and collapsing into a black hole. Now it's unsure why it might have done that, but the idea is that it is possible and we've seen it happen. Okay, think about the early universe, right? You've had the Big Bang that's created all of the mass in the universe and all matter, right? And it's this like soup of hydrogen particles, maybe the odd helium, the odd lithium particle, whatever, all just sort of jostling around with dark matter in sort of a soup in the early universe. You get particles that start to clump together, that becomes like an over density and then everything's drawn to that and you get less dense areas. And so in the end, you end up sort of like clumping up all of the gas and dark matter into what we call these like halos, where we expect, like in the center of them, you're gonna start forming the very first stars in the universe and therefore the very first galaxies and then the very first black holes as well. So you can imagine in this sort of very early universe, the very first stars are gonna form at the center of those over densities and then probably one of those is gonna be massive enough to go supernova and you're gonna end up with the very first black hole forming at around about say like 10 times the mass of the sun. Question is how you then go from that 10 times the mass of the sun all the way to 800 million times the mass of the sun in only the space of a couple of hundred million years. So most black holes, we think they grow via just accretion, right? So they accrete material. A material that is spiraling around it will eventually sort of be eaten 
by the black hole. That's what we mean by accretion, right? And it usually how they do that is they have this accretion disk of spiraling hydrogen gas around them. We tend to be able to spot supermassive black holes that are accreting because that spiraling gas gets very hot because of friction and then it also will glow and energy given out by the supermassive black hole will also cause it to glow in x-rays. So that's how we know that black holes grow that way because we've, we've kind of seen the radiation from them all across the universe. But the thing is, there's a very well-defined limit that a black hole can actually accrete at. Like it can't accrete beyond a certain amount. And that is when you balance the force of gravity that is um, pushing the gas inwards towards the black hole with the force of the radiation pressure that the light that the gas is emitting is pushing the gas away from it. So when you balance those perfectly is when is the maximum amount that you'll be able to accrete, right? And so there's a very nice equation that tells us that that um, amount or the luminosity that you get from balancing those two forces um, is proportional to the mass of the black hole that you've got. So if you're gonna start with something that's like 10 times the mass of the sun, that's not gonna be able to accrete that much, but then as, as it gets bigger and bigger, it can accrete more and more and more. The thing is, even if it accreted at that maximum level, for the entire time, it would only just be able to form an 800 million times mass of the sun supermassive black hole, right? And we also know that at least black holes in our local universe that we have observed do not accrete at that maximum amount throughout their lifetime. Sometimes they, they can accrete more than that because that um, relies on the assumption that everything is sort of ser spherically symmetric. So there's a lot of assumptions thrown in there, but if the geometry is just right, you can exceed that limit, but only for a short space of time, because if you start to accrete loads and loads of gas, then the supermassive black hole is gonna get really active, start throwing off material, which then expels all the gas that you were gonna accrete anyway, um, far away from the black hole. It like throws it out from the black hole. So the black holes that we've observed in our own universe, they show that kind of cycle of accretion and then stopping and then accretion again and then stopping. And so this sort of like really fluctuating growth pattern. So if the black holes in the early universe are like the ones we've seen, then there's no way that you can grow them from that small to that big that quickly. The other thing that's obviously involved here is mergers as well. So we have seen from simulations of the early universe that a lot of the halos of gas and dark matter where the first stars and galaxies form, they tend to end up merging together uh, in the early universe because everything is a lot denser before the universe has expanded. So people for a while saying, well, you can just circumvent the whole, the black holes can't grow that big in that short space of time if you have a lot of mergers. The problem is the number of mergers you would need is really quite large. And when you have that number of mergers, you know, of the two halos together, you're sort of throwing everything together, but you're throwing too much material together. So you end up with a very chaotic system. And so you're actually not likely to actually merge the black holes. They end up sort of interacting and just sort of throwing everything off different orbits because of the gravitational interaction. They never end up spiraling together because everything's just too energetic because you've just thrown too much into the system. So you can't grow them by accretion and you can't grow them by mergers either, which is worrying. And so theorists started saying, well, maybe they don't start at the 10 times the mass of the sun level in the early universe we can probably make them grow to 800 million times the mass of the sun if we start at something like a thousand or 10,000 times the mass of the sun. And so that's what simulation people did for a long time is they just said, look, our seed black hole mass, the mass that the, our black holes are going to start off at is gonna be about a thousand or 10,000 because that's the only way we can end up matching observations. So people then were thinking, well, how on earth would you form a black hole straight away that was a thousand times the mass of the sun, right? Like starting at getting towards supermassive level and not just the solar mass level that you start with in terms of like, you know, the things that LIGO has been detecting that's 30 times the mass of the sun. And so because people were thinking of ways that you could form a thousand times mass of the sun black hole just straight off the bat, people looked back to that third option of forming black holes. So not supernova, not neutron star mergers, but direct collapse. And so what I talked about before, that idea of direct collapse of a star straight into a black hole, that still wouldn't 
be able to give you a thousand times the mass of the sun black hole because you would need some a star that was a thousand times the mass of the sun and the biggest star we've ever seen at least in our own galaxy is 300 ish times the mass of the sun that's kind of an upper limit probably lower than that but it's about 300 times and so the idea then came about that you would have direct collapse of the of a gas cloud itself in the early universe so if you imagine you know the two of these halos of dark matter and gas and dust that are going to form the first stars and galaxies if you've got two next to each other if you imagine that one starts to form stars first just because it had a denser region the gas was able to cool and collapse under its own gravity because uh, you need cold gas to make stars because it has to be cold enough to sort of all collapse in on itself if you have hot gas then it's going to be too energetic and you're just going to have particles just flying around everywhere and nothing's going to want to come together collapse and make something then hot enough to start fusion so one of those uh, halos ends up collapsing and forming stars first right what that then does to the other halo is obviously sort of shines energy and light and radiation from those first stars onto the gas in the second halo. And so what that will do is heat that gas and stop it um, from sort of collapsing to form stars. Now the reason that a lot of those structures don't collapse is because you've got gravity pushing it in on what in one sense and then you've got the pressure from the radiation from the photons being produced pushing it out again that's why the sun doesn't collapse either it's gravity is constantly pulling it in and the fusion of hydrogen into helium in the center of the sun is constantly giving you this pressure outwards and those forces balance so in that second halo you've constantly got gravity trying to collapse the whole system but you've no radiation pressure from stars having formed because you've got all this radiation which is heating the gas and stopping stars from forming so what instead you've got is something that's constantly wanting to collapse under its own gravity but is too hot to end up forming stars and so the idea is that if you have this big halo of stuff that's been kept from forming stars by some other halo that has managed to then the idea is that could directly collapse into a black hole and then that would be the seed for the supermassive black holes and presumably then that would sort of merge with this halo and become the center of the eventual galaxy that would form in that halo. So that's the idea. Obviously proving that that is happening is going to be incredibly difficult, right? So I tried to recently discovered this object that was dubbed CR7. So what this object was, was yes, one of these objects found in the really early universe. So Redshift 7, first 700 million years of the universe's history. And what they found was that this object contained both, you know, the first generation of stars, but also um, emission from gas that clearly wasn't forming stars, but was being radiated by the energy from other stars. And so you can imagine it was one of these objects with the two uh, halos where one was being sort of irradiated by the energy from stars in the early universe and therefore could be a potential site for one of these direct collapse black holes of this pristine gas in the early universe. So we probably won't ever be able to observe that gas actually collapsing, that would be a little cosmic coincidence if we did see it in this one object. But if we could find more of these objects at these massive distances of 13 billion years away from us, then that would help give um, more traction to this theory that all of the supermassive black holes that we see in the early universe have been seeded by these direct collapse black holes of this pristine gas in the early universe. And so if we're going to find more of these distant objects, then we're going to need a telescope that has been designed to detect distant things. And so the James Webb Space Telescope will be crucial for this, trying to prove that in the early universe, the first supermassive black holes are seeded by these direct collapsed uh, pristine gas clouds in halos. And so this is another area of astronomy that is dependent on the James Webb Space Telescope. Launching fine, deploying fine, all working fine. So again, everybody needs to keep their fingers crossed that James Webb, when it actually finally launches, everything is okay. Because there is a lot of areas of astronomy that are riding on it, not just this one. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. I had a lot of fun making it, so I hope you had fun watching it too. Next week, it'll be another Sky News, but until then, do not forget that Comet 46P is gonna be in the sky, sort of, you know, December 14th, 15th, 
16th along with the Geminids meteor shower. So make sure you get out there and see if you can spot any of the meteors or the comet as well. Until next week, guys, I'm Dr. Becky. Over and out.